Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. Let me take you back to when I was just starting out as a technical writer at this small software company. Fresh out of college with an English degree, I was thrilled to land a job that actually used my writing skills. The company was a startup, one of those places where everyone wore multiple hats. But for me, it was perfect. I got to dive into the world of software documentation, learning the ins and outs of the programs we developed. At first, everything was great. I had my own little corner where I could work on user manuals and help files. The developers would send me their notes and not turn their text speak into something the average user could understand. It wasn't glamorous, but it was fine. Then things started to change. The company hit some rough patches, and we all felt the strain. People started leaving, including our administrator. She was the one who kept everything running smoothly, from scheduling meetings to ordering supplies. When she left, it was like a void opened up in the office. One day, I walked into our weekly development meeting, no bed in hand, ready to jot down any new features I needed to document. And that's when it happened. Project manager, hey, since you're already taking notes for your work, why don't you take the minutes for the meeting? Oh, um, I've never done that before. Are you sure? Yeah, you're a writer, right? It should be easy for you. I felt my stomach drop. This wasn't part of my job. I was there to write documentation, not play secretary. But I was still new, still trying to prove myself. So, I nodded and agreed. As the meeting started, I remembered all those times my brothers would miss out their chores on purpose. They'd do such a bad job that my parents would give up and assign the tasks to me instead. It was annoying then, but now, now it gave me an idea. Project manager says, Alright, let's start with a new feature rollout. Developer 2, what's the status? Well, we're still ironing out some bugs in the main module. I wrote down developer 2 admits to creating buggy code. Developer 1, hey, maybe if you spent less time on Reddit, we'd have fewer bugs. I dutifully noted, developer 1 accuses developer 2 of wasting time on social media instead of working. The meeting continued like this, with me recording every little jab, joke, and off-topic comment. When someone mentioned going out for drinks later, I included that too. By the end of the meeting, my... Notes were a mess of gossip, banter, and very little actual work discussion. The next day I compiled my minutes and sent them out to the entire company. Just as I've been instructed, I made sure to format everything professionally, making it look like a proper document. Then I waited. It didn't take long for the fallout to begin. My email binged with a new message. It's the project manager saying, Can you come to my office? I walked in trying to keep a neutral expression. Did you really include all this in the official minutes? Yes, I did. I thought it was important to capture everything discussed in a meeting. Isn't that what minutes are for? But this makes us look unprofessional. You can't send that things like Developer 3 suggests solving the bug by turning it off and on again to the whole company. I'm sorry, I did not realize. This is my first time taking minutes. I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything important. The project manager rubbed his forehead, looking stressed. Okay, look, we'll need to send that a correction. And in the future, maybe we should have someone else handle the minutes. If you think that's best, I'm really more comfortable focusing on a technical writing anyway. And just like that, I was off the hook. Word spread quickly about the minute taken incident. And suddenly, no one was asking me to do anything outside my job description. Some of the developers even started avoiding eye contact with me in the break room, probably worried I was taking mental notes of their conversations. As for the company, they eventually hired a proper administrative assistant to handle things like meeting minutes. My husband and I have been married for five years when we welcomed our little boy into the world. He was the light of our lives, but from the start we knew he had some health issues. At six months old, we discovered he had severe allergies to several fruits, particularly strawberries and kiwis. The doctors warned us that even a small amount could cause a life-threatening reaction. We were terrified but determined to keep our son safe. 
My mother-in-law, on the other hand, was a whole different story. She'd always been a bit set in her ways, shall we say. When we told her about our son's allergies, she scoffed and said, In my day, we didn't have all these fancy allergies. Kids these days are just too soft. I tried to explain the severity of the situation, but she wouldn't listen. Every time she visited, it was the same argument. Please don't bring any strawberries or kiwis when you come over. It's dangerous for our son. Oh, stop being so dramatic. A little fruit never hurt anyone. My husband would try to intervene, but his mother would just pat his cheek and say, Don't you worry, dear. Mother knows best. It was exhausting, but we managed to keep things under control. That is until my son's second birthday. We had a small party at our house, just family and a few close friends, and I made sure to prepare all the food myself, carefully avoiding any allergens. Everything was going well, until I walked into the kitchen and saw my mother-in-law cutting up strawberries and kiwis. What are you doing? You know he can't eat those. Nonsense. It's his birthday. He should have some treats. I tried to take the fruit away, but she held a plate out of my reach. You're being ridiculous. I raised three children, and they all turned out fine. A little fruit won't hurt him. Before I could stop her, she marched into the living room where my son was playing. I called out to my husband, panic rising in my chest. Stop her. She's got strawberries and kiwis. My husband jumped up, but we were too late. By the time we reached him, our mother-in-law had already given our son a piece of strawberry. See, he's fine. You worry too much. But he wasn't fine. Within minutes, his face started swelling, and he began to wheeze. We grabbed our emergency kit and rushed him to the hospital, leaving our shocked guests behind. The next few hours were a blur of doctors, nurses, and terrifying moments when we thought we might lose our little boy. But thankfully, the medical team was able to stabilize him. As we sat by our son's hospital bed, my husband turned to me with tears in his eyes. I can't believe she did this. I am so sorry. It's not your fault, but we can't let this happen again. We agreed that we needed to take drastic action. When we got home, we found my mother-in-law still at our house acting as if nothing had happened. Oh, you're back. How's the little one? I'm sure it was just a bit of indigestion. I've never felt rage like I did in that moment. My hands shook as I spoke. He almost died. Do you understand that? Your grandson almost died because he would have listened to us. Don't be so dramatic. I'm sure it wasn't that serious. My husband tells her, Mom, it was that serious. The doctor said if we'd been a few minutes later, he might not have made it. Well, I've never heard of such a thing. In my day... I couldn't take it anymore. I exploded. I don't care about your day. This is now, and your ignorance almost killed our child. My husband put his hand on my shoulder, his voice firm as he addressed his mother. Mom, we need you to leave. Now. But I'm just trying to help. You're not helping. You're endangering our son. Until he can respect our decisions as parents, we don't want you around him. She lived in a huff, muttering about ungrateful children. As soon as the door closed behind her, I broke down in tears. My husband held me and we cried together. The stress of the day finally catching up with us. In the weeks that followed, we went low contact with my mother-in-law. She tried to call and visit, but we stood firm. We told her she could only see our son if she educated herself about his allergies and promised to follow our rules. Sometimes being a parent means making tough choices, but I know we made the right one. I recently listened to a story during a casual conversation with my elderly relatives, and it was a shocking revelation. I asked my mom about it and she confirmed that it was true, though they had initially told me a censored version. I knew that my grandparents had told my dad to move out when he was young, but the version my dad told me was that it happened when he finished high school and applied for a job. The real version is much worse. My grandmother married young and had my dad six months after the wedding. Back then, if you were expecting a child, the parents of both parties would arrange a marriage. This is what happened here. When my dad was born, his father went out to celebrate because he had a son. Unfortunately, when my dad was just six days old, there was an accident. His father, who was riding a bicycle, collided with a truck. The truck's driver survived, but there was no insurance because my grandfather was heavily intoxicated. 
This left my grandmother in a difficult situation. No job, no money, and an infant to care for. When my dad was seven, his grandparents arranged the marriage for their daughter. My step-grandfather was afraid of becoming a father at a young age, but did everything he could with his limited resources. My grandmother took on odd jobs, but her drinking habits led to her getting fired repeatedly. Eventually, they decided she would stay home and take care of her children, with my dad acting as a replacement parent for his step-siblings. Things took a turn for the worse when my dad was 16 and in high school. Although he wasn't a bad student, his younger siblings were struggling academically. One of his younger brothers failed to advance to the next grade in elementary school. My grandmother became furious and forced my dad out of the house, screaming at him, Take your clothes and get out. We'll see how long you stay in high school now. At that time, there were laws requiring children to stay in school until they were 18, and it was illegal to hire minors. My dad managed to find odd jobs and appearance of his schoolmates allowed him to stay with them for several weeks. One of his teachers even let him stay with them and got a lawyer to check if emancipation was possible in his case. However, when they went to court, my grandmother lied, claiming she never forced him out and that he was a bad son who drank excessively, had poor grades, played truant, and mistreated his siblings. Despite the teacher having school records to the contrary, emancipation was not granted. The judge could have forced my grandmother to take my dad back in, but he refused. My step-grandfather, who was a better parent than my grandmother, promised and delivered money every month to support my dad. My dad eventually finished high school, and although there was talk of university, he chose to get a job, find a place to live, and eventually met my mom. After their wedding, they initially lived with my grandparents. During that time, strangers would often show up at their door, demanding money that my drinking relatives were supposed to repay. The situation finally ended when my parents moved into their own place. Several years passed without contact, and then my step-grandfather passed away. My grandmother inherited their apartment, which had no mortgage, although she had no retirement savings because she hardly worked. She was entitled to 80% of her husband's retirement pension, according to the law. She contacted my dad once to tell him he would never inherit the apartment or his stepfather's money, which was her way of holding on to control. Years later, a hospital clerk called unexpectedly. My grandmother had developed diabetes, but never treated it, continuing to drink heavily instead. Despite having money for alcohol, she neglected to pay for utilities and rent, eventually accruing so much debt that it exceeded the value of her apartment, leading to its loss. Her good children had money for alcohol, but not for their mother. Her only daughter, who was married, wanted to take out a loan to bail out my grandmother and secure the apartment for her own children. However, my grandmother refused to sign a contract for the apartment, demanding money instead which led my uncle to block the transaction. He initially wanted to help and pay all the debt, but not to give money directly to my grandmother, knowing she would likely spend it all without settling her debts. As a result, she lost the apartment and some friends took her in. She badmouthed my dad, her daughter, and her son-in-law to them. Eventually, one friend saw her true character and passed her on to another person, and then another, and another. The last person came home one day to find my grandmother and some of her sons drinking with many valuable items missing from the house. Although the host said nothing at first, fearing confrontation, they waited until the sons left and then called paramedics for an elderly lady with diabetes who wasn't lucid. The paramedics weren't sure if her condition was due to diabetes or all the alcohol, so they called the police as well. The police initially tried to blame the host, but the host had a recording of themselves begging the sons not to share alcohol with my grandmother. With this evidence, the police couldn't arrest the host, and the paramedics took my grandmother to the hospital. My grandmother ended up losing both of her legs. The hospital kept her for several weeks, and during that time she gave my parents' address as her own, which led a clerk to call my parents. They had to show all the documents and explain that my grandmother had gone no contact with them 
taking out loans in my dad's name, kept money he had to repay, taking the home that her parents had left for him and more. The hospital couldn't demand that my parents take her in. My dad actually wanted to. But my mom asked, what will you do when your mom invites your brothers over and one of them gets so drunk that he harms me or our daughter? Referring to me. None of her good sons took her in. The hospital clerks tried to place her in a home for the elderly, but it didn't work out. The home had a strict no alcohol policy which she disregarded. She invited her sons over, they drank vodka, and some items went missing from many rooms, as you might imagine. Eventually, her daughter took her in and they moved to another place. They officially moved to live with the parents of her son-in-law, but the real reason was that it was 180 kilometers from our city, and they hoped that my dad's stepbrothers wouldn't visit. These stepbrothers had no jobs and only received some money from adult protective services, which they used to buy alcohol. They never visited despite making many promises. I know my parents visited several times and left some money, which my uncle took, not for himself, but to buy food, medical supplies, or hire a nurse. He told them that if they gave the money directly to my aunt, she would give it to her mother, who would then spend it on alcohol. My grandmother eventually passed away and was buried locally. All her good sons attended the funeral, which quickly turned into a huge argument. They demanded money from my parents and my aunt and uncle, claiming that they had taken the pension money and become rich. However, explaining that all the money had gone to nurses and medical equipment fell on deaf ears. And that is the uncensored story of how one person wasted her life. I was raised in a big family with limited resources and it kinda taught me the importance of respecting boundaries and shared spaces. So when I finally moved out and rented a place of my own, I was thrilled to have a designated parking spot. It wasn't much, but it was mine. The duplex I lived in was nothing fancy, just a modest two-story building with a shared driveway. At the end of it, there were two parking spots, one for each unit. It was a simple arrangement, but it worked, or at least it was supposed to. I had been living there for about six months when the incident happened. It was a Friday and I just finished a grueling 12-hour shift at the hospital where I worked as a nurse. All I wanted was to park my car, grab a quick bite and crash into bed. But as I pulled into the driveway, I saw something that made my blood boil. There in my spot was a shiny red sports car I'd never seen before. I sat there for a moment, engine idling, wondering what to do. That's when I noticed my neighbor's car in their usual spot. And next to it, this intruder. Now, I'm not usually a confrontational person, but something in me snapped. Maybe it was the exhaustion, or maybe it was a blatant disregard for common courtesy. Whatever it was, I decided I wasn't going to let this slide. I did the only thing I could think of. I parked my car directly behind the red sports car, effectively blocking it in. The driveway was tight, and there was no way they could maneuver out without me moving. As I got out of my car, I went inside, greeted my wife, and told her what had happened. You won't believe what I just did. What's that? Some jerk parked in my spot. So I plugged him in. You did what? Yep. I hope they need to leave before I do tomorrow morning. My wife just shook her head, but I could see a hint of amusement in her eyes. We went about our evening as usual, had dinner, and settled in to watch some TV. About two hours later, there was a soft knock at our door. I opened it to find a man standing there looking uncomfortable and slightly embarrassed. Uh, hi, I'm really sorry to bother you, but let me guess. You're the one who parked in my spot? Yes, and I'm so sorry. I didn't realize it was a sign parking. I'm a friend of your neighbor and they said I could park there. Well, now you know. It's clearly marked as resident parking. I know. I should have paid more attention. Look, I really need to get going. Would you mind moving your car? I stood there for a moment, letting him squirm. Part of me wanted to make him wait to teach him a lesson, but I'm not cruel, just annoyed. Alright, I'll move it, but next time, pay attention to where you're parking. Absolutely. It won't happen again. Thank you so much. I grabbed my keys and followed him out. As we walked to the cars, I noticed how he kept glancing at me nervously. When he saw how tightly I parked behind him, his eyes widened. 
Wow, you really plucked me in good. Yep, that was the idea. I moved my car and he quickly got into his fancy sports car. As he was about to drive off, he rolled down his window. Again, I'm really sorry about this. It won't happen again. See that it doesn't. How was that he drove off into the night? I never saw him or his flashy car again. It felt real good parking my car in its rightful spot. It might seem pity to some, but sometimes you need to stand up for what's yours, even if it's just a parking spot. The next day I saw my neighbor outside and decided to have a little chat. Hey, about your friend who parked in my spot yesterday. Oh man, I'm so sorry about that. He told me what happened. I should have known better than to tell him he could park there. Just make sure it doesn't happen again. We each have our own spot for a reason. Absolutely, it won't happen again. From that day on, there were never any more parking issues. Sometimes a little passive-aggressive action is all it takes to maintain peace in the neighborhood. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.